Hello, and welcome to Star USA Training. Today is Tuesday, November 15th, and we will be talking about disclosures. We are recording the webinar. The recording and other materials will be made available after the broadcast. All participants are currently muted, and the question and answer feature is available if you have any questions. If they come in, I'll answer questions throughout, and then I will take more at the end after we turn off the recording. There are credits available with the NCBFAA. You can email a request for that to train at starusa.org after the webinar. Please include your email address and your NCBFAA ID, and we will get those submitted. Star USA is a consulting advice training and services firm in the field of international trade and compliance. We're based out of Northeast Ohio. We've been here for the past 25 years. We provide an array of services to importers, exporters, brokers, carriers, and forwarders of many different sizes and skill levels. Our prep course for the April 2023 Customs Broker License Exam starts in January. You can sign up now if you'd like. The Peggy Easton Scholarship provides a free version of the course, and it will close for this session of the course at the end of November. So get your entry in if you'd like to be considered. We would love to have you join us. STAR was founded on the premise that knowledge is power, and we believe that sharing our experience can help you improve and strengthen yourself as an individual while providing value to your organizations. We are CTPAT certified as a U.S. customs broker, and we take pride in finding the right balance of service and compliance for our clients. My name is Joe Harper. I'm a principal with STAR USA. I have my customs broker license, and I've been working in the international trade compliance business for over a decade. During that time, I've worked with clients of pretty much every scope and size and across nearly every major industry. I hope you learned something from today's session and we look forward to your questions. Today, we are talking about disclosures. There are different types of disclosures depending on if it's for an import violation or an export violation and which government agencies are involved. Some of the basics are the different types. With import, there are prior disclosures. Those are disclosures made under 19 U.S.C. 1500s usually to a government agent of Customs and Border Protection. You need to make it before the government is aware. They are done either verbally, the initial conversation, or written. If you make a verbal disclosure, you have to follow it up with a written disclosure. And after that initial conversation, either orally or by email, you will follow it up with the perfected fully detailed disclosure that outlines all the violations and pays duties if there are duties owed to the government agencies. 19 U.S.C. 1592 is about entering or introducing merchandise into the commerce of the United States by a statement that is false or omits anything or clerical errors that are patterns. The levels of violation there are negligence, on the low end, gross negligence, and fraud. It also covers several free trade agreements. Some of them are not outlined under there. And then 1593A covers false drawback claims. A voluntary self-disclosure, on the other hand, is about export violations, and it is disclosing the circumstances of a violation of either the Export Administration regulations or the Foreign Trade regulations to the appropriate government agent. It also needs to happen before the government is aware. It has to be written. There aren't oral disclosures under the EAR. And then also it will be followed up by the fully perfected disclosure with all the details of violations and the corrections. EAR or the Export Administration regulation violations include things like violations of a denial order, not getting a license or misusing a license or sending something Thing without authorization. Be very cautious under export when you are asking for help informally from federal officials. If you accidentally disclose a violation during conversation, the voluntary self-disclosure may not give you any protection. If you need a question answered, we really recommend going through outside firms who will not need to say what company they're talking about or give any details. 
For prior disclosure, the agencies that you're working with are always going to start with Customs and Border Protection, specifically through the Fines, Penalties, and Forfeitures branch. You will usually reach out to the specific center of excellence and expertise that you're working with, and they'll then route you to an FPNF officer working with that C. You can also make disclosures to partner government agencies generally through CBP. It will provide penalty avoidance if you submit a prior disclosure correctly in a timely manner and with all the details. But you can only avoid penalties in cases of negligence and gross negligence. If you have committed fraud, which is intentional violation of laws, then it's not going to let you avoid those penalties simply by submitting a prior disclosure. A voluntary self-disclosure can be made to the Bureau of Census, the Bureau of Industry and Security, or BIS, and specifically you'd be working with the Office of Export Enforcement, or OEE. You can also make voluntary self-disclosures to the Directorate of Defense Trade Controls or the Office of Foreign Assets Control. For the purposes of this webinar, we're going to focus on BIS and Census. OFAC and DDTC are something that we really strongly recommend you work with a lawyer on and you do not try to take it on by yourself. Those are areas of a more serious nature and they have some different requirements than we're going to be talking about today. Under export, a disclosure is only a mitigating factor. It does not allow you to avoid penalties simply by submitting it. And then what constitutes a violation? For customs, a violation would be entry by means of false statement, the introduction or attempt to enter any merchandise by means of a material or false statement, or the material omission of such statements, whether that's by negligence, gross negligence, or fraud. It is also a violation to conduct customs business without a license or violate any other requirement imposed on a licensed customs broker. For census, a violation is a failure to file electronic export information or an EEI, filing that EEI late, submitting false or misleading information, or furthering illegal activities. And that could be a false statement, or it could be exporting to someone you're not allowed to export to. For BIS, violations would be engaging in prohibited contact, conduct, causing, aiding, or abetting a violation, solicitation or attempt to have a violation, conspiracy, acting with knowledge of a violation. That one really puts the onus on the exporter to know what you're doing. The BIS has a specific expectation on what you should know as an exporter, things like the end use of the merchandise that you're exporting, the end user, whether or not those goods are going to be re-exported. And you are held to that standard regardless of whether or not you did know. Because you should know, you're held accountable for it. Just like CBP can hold you accountable for reasonable care, BIS can hold you accountable for expected due diligence. Possession with the intent to export illegally is a violation. So is misrepresenting and or concealing facts. Any sort of evasion. So if you say it's going to one location, but it's actually going to another, or you just leave off the end location and it's being transshipped. Failure to comply with reporting or record keeping requirements, altering a license in any way, and acting contrary to the terms of a denial order. Those are all export violations under BIS. And that kind of tells you if you have a violation, whether you need to file with census, with BIS, or with both. Often, if there's a violation in export, you're going to need to file disclosures with both of those agencies. We're going to take a look at some of the penalty frameworks. Under import, they're based on duty loss or no duty loss, and the degree of violation. So if you remember, fraud is the worst kind of violation, but then there's also gross negligence and negligence. Generally, violations under 19 U.S.C. 1592 or 1593A, those penalties won't exceed $50,000. Now, that is adjusted for inflation, and it's not adjusted in the regs. Violations under 1436 which is conveyance arrival, 1595, aiding unlawful import, and 1641, those are customs brokers penalties. Those penalties usually don't exceed $200,000 or around that. Under 
something that you did not have a prior disclosure and there was duty loss, the penalty for fraud, which would be the highest penalty, the minimum penalty is going to be five times the total loss of duty and the maximum penalty could be up to eight times the total loss of duty. If you filed a prior disclosure, it will not be mitigated, but there will be 100% duty loss on top of paying the duty owed instead of five times or eight times. For gross negligence without a prior disclosure, you're looking at two and a half to four times the total loss of duty. If you make a prior disclosure, you will just have to pay interest on the duty loss as well as paying back that owed duty. Negligence, you're looking at half times total loss of duty as a penalty on top of paying back the duty, all the way up to two times. If you file a prior disclosure, you would just be paying the interest on that duty loss. If there's no duty loss for a specific violation and you don't file a prior disclosure, under fraud, you would pay 50% of the dutiable value as a minimum and a maximum would be 80% of the dutiable value. These can get pretty high if you're importing high dollar value items. If you file a prior disclosure though, they will simply assess 10% of the dutiable value as a penalty. Gross negligence, your percentages that you're looking at are lower. And if you file a prior disclosure for either gross negligence or negligence, if there's no duty loss, you would not owe customs any duty and there would be no penalty assessed on top of it. Now your prior disclosure again, needs to be complete and timely. Customs will give you notice for the penalties that they are assessing. They'll usually give you some prior notice and say we're intending to assess these penalties for drawback, broker penalties, record keeping penalties, falsifying or not submitting a manifest or equipment and vessel repairs, also for the degrees of fraud and negligence. But they will just assess penalties without telling you in advance for aiding unlawful importation, having a manifest that's related to illegal drugs, counterfeit trademark, or conveyance arrival reporting or entry clearance violations. But usually you'll get a little bit of a heads up if there's a penalty being assessed. Under export, you can have both civil and criminal penalties assessed. These are general rules of thumb. They are not exact and they are updated at least annually. Under the foreign trade regulations or the FTR, those penalties have generally been delegated out to customs and the Office of Export Enforcement under BIS. These are penalties for failure to file, late filing or filing false information of the electronic export information, also known as the EEI. Under civil penalties, the maximum penalty is around $15,000 per violation. That's per EEI that is filed late or not filed or has false information. They also have a mitigation framework, so don't panic too much, but understand that this is the option that's available to them. If it is determined that the violation happens at a criminal level, you can be assessed $50,000 per violation and have up to 10 years imprisonment if determined. Under the EAR or the Export Administration Regulations, the civil penalty maximum is around $330,000 per violation or up to two times the transaction value. They can also add loss of export privileges as an administrative or civil penalty. The criminal amount for the EAR here of max of $1 million or five times the value per violation up to 20 years imprisonment is for institutions. For individuals, the maximum penalty is around $250,000 and the max imprisonment option is 10 years. If anything involved in your export transaction that is found to be in violation includes merchandise or information that's subject to national security controls, the penalties and prison times can be increased. ITAR, the maximum civil penalty is a little over 1.2 million. That's for violations of 22 U.S.C. 2778, sorry for all of the numbers, 
2778 controls arms, exports, and imports, and that's around 1.3 million. Violations of 22 USC 2779A, which is prohibition of incentive payments, don't take bribes to export things incorrectly, cannot exceed $925,000 or five times the amount of the prohibited incentive payment, whichever is greater. And violations of 22 USC 2780, which covers transactions with countries supporting acts of international terrorism, the civil penalty cannot exceed $1,101,061. Criminal penalties are around $1 million per violation, up to 10 years imprisonment. And then OFAC, the answer is that this really depends on the country and the material involved. The baseline civil penalty adjusted in 2022 was $97,529. But if there are contributing factors, then the maximum increases. There are mitigated amounts for export. Usually, if it is a first offense under census, there's guidance for what happens if you don't file, if you file late, and any other violations, depending on how many times you have offended. Now, these can be adjusted for inflation as well. This is just the baseline. And under BIS, if you file a voluntary self-disclosure and it's a non-egregious case, generally the penalty may be assessed at half the transaction value with a maximum of $125,000 per violation. If no voluntary self-disclosure, they can mitigate to a maximum of $250,000 per violation. If it's egregious, if you file a VSD, half the applicable maximum. Other violations under this census area include things like providing incorrect value or incorrect U.S. principal party and interest or USPPI, providing the wrong consignee, end user, commodity description, port of export, not filing the license number, not obtaining a power of attorney for filing EEIs, failing to identify a transaction as routed not correcting information in AES as soon as those changes are known, not providing the carrier with proof of filing, and not retaining records. For ITAR or OFAC violations, a voluntary self-disclosure can mitigate the penalty down to 30 to 40 percent of the maximum, depending on the exact circumstances surrounding. Okay, so when should you disclose? You can make corrections without disclosing anything. If the error that is made is not a pattern. Both import and export look at whether a violation is part of a pattern of mistakes. If it's just a one-off mistake, you can make those corrections without filing a full disclosure. Import, you can have your broker correct it within the first 10 days of filing entry without filing any other corrections. You can also have them submit a post summary correction or PSC. That can be done anytime from 10 days from entry up to 300 days after the entry is filed. It must be done before the entry is liquidated. Not all entries can have PSCs done on them if they liquidated earlier or if there was an informal entry, you cannot file a PSC. And you may determine if there are multiple entries that need to be corrected not to file a PSC. Generally, if it is an error you can address by refiling the entry using a post summary correction, it's a good idea to do. If your post-summary correction period has passed, you may decide to protest. That can be done anytime from liquidation up to 180 days after liquidation. So generally, there are correction options up to a year and a half after an entry is filed. Not all, not all items are subject to be changed using a post-summary correction or a protest. There are certain parameters they have to fall within in order to use a PSC or a protest. But a lot of them are, and they're very useful correction options. Under export, for EEI fatal error messages, that indicates that the filing was not accepted and the shipment is not clear to export, so they must be addressed 
prior to the merchandise departing. If you have a warning or verify message on an EEI, you need to correct that within four days of getting that message. Can appear for things like unusual weights or dollar amounts for a particular Schedule B classification. It may not require any action. It may be saying the filing was accepted, but there's flags and you should just take another look. About 50% of the time that you get a warning or a verify message, you need to actually fix something. If there are any changes, corrections, or cancellations, you should address those as soon as possible. Now, disclosures can be done for any time period, but you're encouraged to go back five years because the government agency can go back five years. And if you only correct three years worth, but the government agency figures out that you've been making this error for all five years, they can assess penalties on the two years that you didn't disclose. So usually we recommend do the full five years, correct everything possible. That way everything is covered under that mitigation umbrella. You wanna figure out if there is a pattern of errors. Patterns are problematic. So things that you ask yourself in order to figure out if there's a pattern, or how was this error discovered? Did we do an internal review? Did the vendor or customer tell us? Was it a broker or a freight forwarder who came forward? Or was it an auditor? Or did we get a CBP 28 or a fines and penalties notice? When did it happen and for how long did it go on? How many times has this happened? When was it discovered? Did I just figure this out? Or have we known about it for three years and just trying to end run it? Was it human error or is it systemic? And does this fall under reasonable care or due diligence? You want to make sure that you are prepared to address pattern issues. If you got a CBP 28, that can sometimes preclude your ability to file a prior disclosure. Sometimes customs will allow you to file a prior disclosure if it's just a CBP 28. Sometimes they will not. CBP 29s are a notice of action. And that generally says, hey, we know there's an error and here are your penalties. So you want to address it before that. If you get one CBP 29 and it's just focused on one entry and you discover that error on that one entry applies to a whole bunch of your other entries, you can often initiate a prior disclosure and get out in front of those other entries and provide that penalty avoidance umbrella for those other entries. You also want to know how severe of an issue it is. On the import side, we have priority trade issues that Customs does us the huge favor of publishing, where they say these are the things we really care about. Those are things like agriculture and quota, anti-dumping and countervailing duties, import safety, intellectual property rights, revenue like value, classification, and origin, and then textiles or wearing apparel and trade agreements. Not on the list, but definitely something that they're spending a lot of time looking at as well is forced labor. Under export, you're considering the elevated risk factors. Those are goods that are licensable. Those are merchandise that's very high value, parties that are either restricted or denied, and systemic errors, that pattern of error. For prior disclosures, if you make an oral disclosure, you then have 10 days to put something in writing and get it over to customs, and then 30 days from finding that first writing to submitting the perfected information. I'm going to tell you that getting all of that information for five whole years of potential errors and reviewing all of your entries can take more than 30 days. So you can request extensions of up to 60 days, but the limit on those is based on the discretion of the officer you're working with. And if you claim those extensions, you have to file a waiver of the statute of limitations for liquidation on those earlier entries in the five years. If you're filing a voluntary self-disclosure, after you make that initial notification, you have to submit the full narrative within 180 days of initial notification to BIS. Census does not have a specific timeline. If you are making a concurrent disclosure to BIS, Census will generally follow that time frame, but you have to set that time frame with the agent who accepts your disclosures.
it's really nice to have six months right up front with BIS instead of having to request extensions consistently if you're working with customs. So there are a lot of things to consider when you're looking at a disclosure and whether or not a disclosure is appropriate for your situation. One thing we always recommend is you should not disclose if you're not confident that you can get the right information or maintain the things that you say you will when you submit your disclosure. Customs has some mitigating factors as well as aggravating factors. The mitigating and aggravating factors for import and CBP entries are found in the 19 CFR 171 appendices. So a mitigating factor is if there's a contributory customs error. That means that customs gave some misleading or erroneous advice in writing to you, or there was an established record available by customs, as long as you reasonably relied upon that information. So if customs has out a classification ruling on an article that is identical to your goods and you rely on that, and then eight years later, customs comes back and rewrites that classification, you can file a disclosure and say, hey, we've been doing it wrong, but we were using what you had said working from that. They will also take it as a mitigating factor if you have extraordinary cooperation with the investigation. So that is beyond the cooperation expected from a person under investigation for a customs violation. Some examples of that include assisting officers to an unusual degree when auditing the books and records of the violator, maybe providing computer runs solely for submission of customs, or helping them obtain additional information related to the subject violation or other violations. Just giving the books and records is not considered extraordinary cooperation because customs has the right to examine any books and records, but really helping them figure out what they're reading and dig through it. Immediate remedial action is huge. So if you identify an error and you immediately start addressing it and then reach out to customs and say, hey, we're going to be filing a disclosure and then get that perfected, but they can see in your entry data that they're reviewing that as soon as you identified it, you started addressing it and it doesn't happen anymore in the past five months while you've been preparing the disclosure, that's a very good mitigating factor. Prior good record is a mitigating factor. If you're able to demonstrate a consistent pattern of imports without violation, being new at importing is a mitigating factor only if it's contributing to the violation and the violation is not due to fraud or gross negligence. If you were simply negligent and you just didn't know that you need to have this paperwork in, that's inexperienced and they'll work with you. They will also mitigate penalties potentially depending on if you are unable to pay the customs penalty. In order to claim that, you need to give copies of income tax returns for the past few years. Customs may waive the production of an audited financial statement if they're able to identify that out of the gate. You can also have mitigation if customs had knowledge of the violation and failed to inform the violators. So they knew about it, they didn't tell you, and you just kept doing it wrong. Under export, remedial response is a mitigating factor. That includes stopping the conduct immediately, filing a voluntary self-disclosure, fully uncovering the causes, telling management, implementing better controls, doing a thorough review of all exports, And extraordinary cooperation with the Office of Export Enforcement means getting them all of the information extremely quickly and going above and beyond. If your license would have been approved if you had filed for a license, that's a mitigating factor, or if it is a first-time violation. On the other hand, there are several aggravating factors. For customs, that is obstructing obstructing the investigation or the audit, withholding evidence, providing misleading information, several violations of the same type that you were already assessed issues for, textile imports that have been subject to illegal transshipment, having motive to evade a prohibition or restriction on the admissibility of merchandise, and failing to comply with a demand for records or summons. Under export, those are things like willfully or recklessly violating a law, concealing, having a pattern of this conduct, 
having been notified before that, either by a government agency or an employee, management involvement, if they can prove that management knew about a violation and it continued to happen, that is an aggravating factor and will result in increased penalties. Having knowledge of the issue, whether that is you actually knew about it or you should have known about it if you had done your due diligence. And if there are any implications for national security or foreign policy based on the merchandise or information involved in your transaction, that is also an aggravating factor. Some other things that all of the government agencies will take into note include having related violations or having multiple unrelated violations. So you, there was one shipment that you didn't request a license for and it got exported inappropriately, but you also never file your EEIs on time. Your value is consistently declared low. You never perform screening and your Schedule B classifications are almost all wrong. That is an aggravating factor. They'll take into account how big your company is and how good it is at importing and exporting, how long it's been around, how involved it's been, the volume and the value of your transactions, your regulatory history with other agencies, whether or not there was illegal conduct or criminal convictions, whether or not you have a compliance program. And if you do have a compliance program, did it work in this case? Did it discover an error and identify it and stop it? In that case, it would be a mitigating factor. And will they be able to use your case to deter other people? In that case, they may make an example out of you. If you are going to make a disclosure, there's a lot to know. When you suspect that there may be a violation, first thing you need to do is confirm that there is a violation and get a full picture of it. Don't skip ahead to notifying management or disclosing to the government. You want to spend the time to verify that a problem exists and fully know the scope of the issue. Once you know that there's a problem, stop making that same decision. Don't do it again. It might be difficult, but don't keep making mistakes. Remember that remedial action was a factor that counts tremendously as a mitigating factor. And even if it doesn't help you completely avoid penalties, it could be the difference between a negligence and gross negligence penalty on the import side and an accidental or intentional penalty on the export side. Those are vastly different. Then you want to start notifying. You want to tell upper management about the issue. Be prepared to involve all of the teams that may be making the error or contributing to it. Include internal counsel prior to making a disclosure. We always recommend consulting with trained professionals in those areas. If it's classification, talk to a classification professional. Then disclose. That's the initial notification that you're giving to the relevant authorities, whether that's customs, census, or BIS. Make those corrections. So start implementing your permanent corrective actions. Get a list of all of the errors and provide the corrected information. Then perfect your disclosure materials. That's going to include your narrative, all of your exhibits, and make sure that it makes sense and is complete. You submit that final perfected disclosure. Then you're going to accept whatever the government agency hands down and maintain. This is an extremely important part to every government agency. You need to take those corrective actions that you outlined in your narrative and your disclosure and keep doing them. Stay diligent, review your procedures, make updates, handle turnover, address if your operations change or you're acquired, stay on top of things. If you're going to notify management but when you go there, you should be able to state that you have stopped doing the error and have a time frame for how long the temporary measures can remain. Maybe those first measures can only last until your next shipment, Maybe they are perpetual ongoing. You need to have facts, have the data that outlines the errors. Do not have a guess. Do not speculate. You can provide what-if scenarios like penalties. You can provide information from BISs. Don't let this happen to you as helpful because one of the things that management is going to want to know is what does this mean to us? Be really concise. Have details in a manner that can be understood by a layperson. They are not doing your job. They are doing their job. 
So you need to present it to them in a very clear manner that lets anybody who doesn't have your background and information understand it. Pull together an impact assessment. What's the impact of not changing our process? What's the impact of changing it? What do we need internally? What is this going to save us from? Have a plan of action for what to do next. Give some options for whether it's unclear. You want to lay out the whole way from where we are today or where we were yesterday to our company is working perfectly without this as an issue. Also consider any impact and liability for outside parties. When you disclose, you may be inadvertently throwing some other people under the bus. So you need to take that into account. Is it brokers or forwarders, customers and suppliers? Are there other departments at your company or stakeholders? Management is usually interested in getting through the problem and never having to deal with that situation again, but you know your management and what they need. Then when you go to file a disclosure, you want to have the legal baseline, have that full framework and adhere to the provisions and protections and follow the formats completely. If something does not apply to your circumstances, you want to indicate that explicitly. So for example, there were no licensable goods contained in these shipments. That just tells them right up front. Get a representation of all of the transactions with supporting documents and full summaries. Be clear and open. You want to give abundant information, but you're also not trying to bury them in paperwork. You want to just give them a clear beginning to end picture. Illustrate the steps that have been taken to correct the problem going forward and what changes to policy have been implemented to keep things from happening again, avoiding any violations. Those are going to be things like training programs, outreach letters, communication with your broker and your forwarder, tooling adjustments, that kind of thing. When you submit, make sure an expert's involved in your submission before it goes to the government. And once you initiate the disclosure process, that information has to be perfected as rapidly as possible, and you want to stay ahead of it at every step. Having a compliance program is a factor that is considered for everyone. It starts with a compliance manual. That tends to be effective for prevention of error and maintaining systemic compliance. It can also be used as a tool for identifying exactly where errors happened, helps create redundancy, and gives responsibility to specific areas. You also need to have that management commitment, assess the risk, have authorization steps in place. Record keeping is incredibly important. There's penalties for failure to keep records on both the import and the export side. Train your staff, especially your key frontline people. Run your audits. That helps you identify your violations before they grow out of control and lets them potentially be addressed in an earlier correction step than using a disclosure. And then when a violation arises, handle it. Mistakes are going to happen. I just this week had a conversation where I was saying, listen, if you've never done anything wrong, it just means you haven't been doing it long enough. There will be mistakes, but you have to be able to then address those mistakes and identify those mistakes. And that's the part that makes the big difference. These are some helpful resources. They are hyperlinked on here so you can access them from the slides. We really like customs publication ABCs of prior disclosure. That's super helpful when you are filing a disclosure for import violations with customs. CBP also has a whole mitigation for liquidated damages publication on their website that tends to be very helpful. As customs is in charge of assessing penalties for foreign trade regulations often, they have the mitigation policies for the FTR. Census has a website on voluntary self-disclosures and a webinar that they put out on voluntary self-disclosures, both very helpful. BIS has a website on voluntary self-disclosures to them, as well as an overview of export compliance programs, which if you have never considered having a compliance program, it's a great place to start. And then for import prior disclosures in the regulations, that's under 19 CFR 162.74. And for export disclosures for census, it's in 30.74. And for BIS, it's in 764.5. Thank you so much for listening.
email us with any questions you have that do not get answered.